Good morning again, everyone. This is Jim from Ray Marine. Today's topic, Just for Sailors, Tools for Performance, Racing, and Cruising. We're going to be talking to a special guest today. On the line with me is Greg Wells. Greg Wells is a Ray Marine sailing product expert. He's been racing boats since he was a small boy, both inland and on open water. He's done some dinghy racing. He's campaigned some far 40s. Um, he works as a race tactician, so he's got a lot of experience that he's going to share with us today. Um, in his racing career, he's earned several titles, uh, both nationally and across Europe. And uh, he is the, um, he races a Flying 15 two-person race boat, uh, which he is hoping to take to the 2021 World Championships in Perth, Australia. Uh, welcome, Greg. Thanks for joining us this morning. Hi guys. Hi Jim. Thanks for that lovely intro. No pressure. <laughs> so uh, let's get started today. So we're talking about performance sailing, about fast sailing. What are some of the factors that, that go into making decisions for fast sailing? Well, yeah, I think um, when you're racing a boat, uh, there are two as big aspects to it really, which is about um, good decision making, tactical decision making, and also keeping your boat moving fast in, across a different range of conditions. So all the time when you're on a boat as a helmsman or a tactician, you're thinking about your boat speed and have you got the heel angle right, your sail trim, and, and a good feedback always, and this is whether you're on a cruising boat or a racing boat, is how much weight there is on the helm. You know, boats are generally designed not to have much weight on the helm, so if they've got lots of weight, then you've obviously got something wrong. So you're constantly looking at that, and then there's the external factors. Where are the other boats on the course? Are we on the, in phase with wind shifts? What's the current doing? Is there effects from the land? Is the wind being bent? And of course, where are you on the, on the course? Are you already you know, making your way to the first mark or the second mark? And this is all the information you need to digest. And anything that can help with that, uh, or guide you, or assist you with that, it's got to be helpful. So when we're talking sailing, it's actually, it covers a very, very broad range of vessels. Um, you know, everything from dinghies and, and very small and portable boats right on up through giant ocean cruisers. So kind of looking at the smaller end of the spectrum, Greg, what's a good setup for someone that's racing small boats? Well, the small boats um, are a bit different to uh, bigger boats in that uh, generally uh, the dinghies and sports boats of this world uh, are governed very much by class rules and the class rules tend to prohibit the use of certain electronics. As it happens when you're in a, a small boat, uh, you're often racing very close to other boats which are identical. So from a boat speed point of view, you tend to know how you're performing by how you are lining up with another boat. Uh, but what you do need when you're uh, in a dinghy or sports boat is the ability to um, to work the wind shifts. It's a really key part of that of, of the sport of dinghy racing, and uh, a great setup for that is either our micro compass or race master, which are usually permitted in those boats. What are some of the key differences between a, a micro compass and a and a race master for those that haven't seen them before? Well, firstly, the, the micro compass, um, which you can see there in, in, the, in the slide, uh, shows a very clear digits uh, with a wide viewing angle. As you can see, it's got uh, two displays, and that is designed in that sort of um, T segment shape to give the widest possible viewing angle, because most people in dinghies are either trapezing from the side or sometimes even in front of it, so you need that wide viewing angle. Um, but it's the, it's the product of Olympiad champions, really. If you look at the Olympic results for the last four or five Olympiads, I would say that virtually every medalist was, where the product is permitted would have been using the micro compass. It really gives you good, accurate compass information uh, coupled with a um, countdown timer for starts. I see the race master has a couple of more lines uh, on, the, on the bottom of it there. So I see it looks like it has heading and is that's wind shift information on the bottom, you said? Yeah, so, so the race master, which is, um, as you can see, has more data. It's very popular with bigger dinghies, um, such as the one in the picture, and uh, sports boats. The, the big advantage of it is it um, has some additional software that allows you to, um, or helps you to detect wind shifts. You can put in the uh, a manual wind direction and attack angle, and then it will show the wind shifts in a very simple plus and minus format. 
um, which is um, makes life a lot easier uh, when you're making quick decisions on the fly. The uh, other big advantage is the fact that as you can see, it's got two lines of data there. So you never lose your compass information, which a lot of tacticians always want to know what the boat heading is. And obviously you have to switch between uh, different data and lose that, it's uh, quite critical. So uh, it's a great device to race master. It can also actually, it um, does even more. It can actually be networked into a, a larger, and if you do that, you can actually get data such as boat speed, uh, wind, GPS, um, and you can add all sorts of data to that item as long as the class rules permit. And I was going to ask you about class rules. So if I was uh, an aspiring dinghy sailor and I want to up my performance a little bit, how can I find out what's legal to run on my boat? I'll be honest, we used to, uh, on our website, give a list of, and I think you believe it is still there, of all the boats and what, what, what was permitted. But it was changing so rapidly as more and more classes uh, adopted the electronic compass um, and allowed it, such as the lasers, just a couple of years ago, that the best way now is to go onto your class website. Uh, most classes have good websites, and within that website, you'll be able to download those class rules. And it usually specifically says now uh, what electronic items are permitted. Um, but virtually all boats now will permit the micro compass. Uh, majority or probably, yeah, 60% will permit the race master. So when in doubt, definitely check with the class rules for uh, Correct. clarification. Very good. So when we move into um, larger boats, do the rules get relaxed at all for what we can carry on board? Yeah, indeed they do. Um, as you move into um, cruiser, cruiser racers, racing yachts, there really is very little limitation on what you can do with electronics. Um, you can really start to add all sorts of electronic aids to help you with the two, the two key factors of uh, boat speed and decision making. So like, what are the some kind of the key pieces of data that we want to see? What, what's the real basics? Well, firstly, um, the, uh, what I think is worth saying is that Ray Marina, when you get into this area of sailing, has a fantastic um, family of wired and wireless products, some of which you can see in this slide. Um, and they all provide great data, which can be displayed exactly where you need to see it. And that's key as well. No point having good data, you can't see it. Um, what kind of data? Uh, well, the, the basics really, the, the essential data that you should always have is a compass heading, boat speed and depth. Uh, because what that gives you straight away, compass heading will help you identify wind shifts, particularly when sailing to windward. Um, boat speed will give you some idea of the boat's performance. You may not have a reference, but by you know that your boat usually does five and a half, six knots sailing upwind in 10 knots or whatever. So a really useful aid. And then of course you've got to have depth because none of us like to go aground. So those are the basics, um, but I certainly see a lot more information just on this screen right here. So what are the, some of the things that are nice to have? Yeah, the next, the next like, level of data that I personally like to have on a boat, which really helps me with my, um, sort of making my decisions, really is um, the likes of uh, wind. So if you get wind data, GPS uh, and cartography. When you get wind data added to boat speed, you start to get a lot more uh, accurate indication on how your boat's performance is going. Um, you like to know that um, you know, you're doing a certain speed at a certain wind angle. It's very important to know that. The GPS is because now you can compare your speed through the water, and I'll come on to that later, um, with your speed over the ground. And this will then tell you whether, whether there's any effect from tidal currents. And then obviously if you add cartography on one of our fantastic axioms, then you get that bigger picture. You can see where you are um, on the whole course area. You can see what's going on um, in terms of land effects, um, the depth of water and so, forth, and so on and so forth. It gives you a great big picture view. Um, no, I know. Going on from there, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Going on from there, you then would like to get into the sort of what I call advanced data, uh, which is typically what you would have seen on an offshore, or you still see on offshore racing yachts, um, 
So this is sort of data that we call polars, um, things like ley lines, uh, AIS and radar are really helpful when you're doing the big offshore racing. And then some of the weather routing software, I know, for example, Raymarine uh, partners with Predict Wind is really good advanced stuff to have. This, this is stuff that you used to see a lot on offshore racing boats, which is now available to everybody. It's not hard to, to get that data. It's like um, racing cars in the old days used to have things that we don't have on our cars today, which we do. So, um, yeah, it's all out there. Now, just a kind of a, a quick side question. We've been talking a lot about race capabilities. Is any of this data useful on board a cruising boat? Yes, it is actually. As I was just saying, the um, the data is there. Uh, it's it's you know most people are getting these items, and it's really just a question of um, clicking the right boxes on your axiom so you can see this data and use it. So, for example. And we're going to come on to them shortly. Ley lines, if you're wanting to uh, not do too many tacks and a headland. If you had something that was telling you when you tacked that you would clear a ley line, that would be really useful for a cruiser. Uh, if you were trying to get to a, a specific port of call by a certain time uh, to make sure you got a mooring or a berth um, and you wanted to perhaps speed up, uh, knowing what performance you can get out of your boat and how to trim your sails would also be helpful. So there's a lot of information in here, a lot of numbers, a lot of visuals. Um, what are some of the best ways to kind of organize it and display it? I guess we have a lot of different options for that. Yeah, um, really what it's all about here, Jim, is it's about having the data in your sort of uh, line of vision, if you like, line of sight. You don't really want to be looking around to see what or how your performance is. Imagine if you were uh, driving a, a motor car and trying to look on your passengers, you wouldn't look at the car very well. So it's all about trying to get the data that you need um, in your line of sight. So what are some of the ways that we can present it kind of in a logical, easy to understand format? Well, the way Raymarine does this, uh, and it's a unique for Raymarine, um, we have this great blend of uh, wireless and wired instruments. Um, now, that, what that means is we, we can use the, wire, the wireless instruments can be located anywhere. They don't have any cables to run. They've got no holes to drill. You can put them, you know, really in all sorts of places very easily. When you're helming a boat, a good place for example is on the mast. Uh, we have the the wireless uh, maxes, which have the big 20 millimeter or two inch um, um, characters. So you can see those quite easily from a distance, um, which means that, for example, a helmsman um, should be able to be steering his boat around the waves and seeing the numbers that he's trying to sail to. Um, then, of course, you might have your tactician that wants to see the bigger picture, and he may want, therefore, the, uh, the chart plotter um, information which which actually with our system he could then very easily um, see from his iPhone or his iPad because we can mirror that information and so you can That's stay on the rail and still get that uh, information so it's a great um, position we're in in Ray Marine to have this sort of wireless and wired information that can share all the same data uh, across the network using our unique um, MicroTor puck yeah, I guess it's great. It really gives you a lot of flexibility. You can put just the right display in, in just the right location wherever you need it. Correct. When we start to mix the data together, wired and wireless, do we get any improvements in the system or any enhancements or the things that certain parts of the system can do that benefit the others? Yeah, actually we do, um, Jim. What we get, in fact, is accuracy. Um, we have, for example, um, Product called the Evolution uh, Heading Sensor, which is um, a nine axis sensor with um, AHARs built in, so it corrects for the heel angles and, and any, any magnetic influences. It provides some, it's one of the most accurate compasses on the market. That data can be shared on all the wireless displays. Then in the wireless world, we, ha we happen to have a very accurate uh, wind vane, and the wind vane data can be shared on the wired world, but, and it's all completely seamless. So it's some great advantages across having the two, the two systems um, easily networked. So I know a lot of this data 
ultimately is driving us towards something called polars. Can you tell us a little bit about a polar and what we use it for when we're sailing? Yeah, it's a, it's a strange word, polars, um, cold word really. Um, what a polar is really, it's, it's the designer's calculation um, which the designers made for a boat speed potential uh, in any given wind angle or wind strength. So if you look at this example uh, here on the slide, you can see that in um, the, the light blue um, line is 20 knots of breeze and a, a, um, sailing at 80 degrees to the wind, that boat will do 12 knots. So that is that polar for, for that particular boat that this relates to. I think it's a, a PDQ 36. And you can see it's got polars for all the different wind strengths in the same way. So the polar data, is it, is this a racing tool or is this something that every sailor can benefit from? Oh no, I think that uh, as we'll see when we go through to things as I mentioned before, ley lines, um, it's a benefit to cruisers as well as racers. Uh, because what we do is we take this polar information um, and it's, it's, it's that data, if you like, that we then use to get the target speeds and the target wind angles, which in turn allows us to derive the ley lines that means that we can then calculate, as I said before, whether a cruiser can get around a headland or not. So if I'm understanding it correctly, the target speed and the target wind angle, that's what my boat is capable of doing, at least mathematically. And then I have a, I have a target to shoot for, essentially. The, the system's gonna tell me if I'm not quite there or if I can trim up and, and get some better performance. Yeah, exactly that. Um, and I think we've got some pages coming on that show us a bit more clearly. I mean, basically all boats have um, an ideal uh, wind angle where they perform at their, their very best. And very often going from A to B, um, it's much quicker to uh, not sail direct. It's a bit like if you're in your car, I suppose, going um, between two towns, it's quicker to use a motorway and to drive through uh, villages and towns. You, 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 um, you, you are much better off, if you like, going at the performance speed of the boat to get to where you want to get to. We actually have a name for this. We call it BEST VMG, which stands for Velocity Made Good. And I'm sure some of the people out there have heard of that term. Very good. So where can I find out the polar information for my boat? I, I have a boat and I, I have no idea where to get something like that. Is this something that's, that is commonly available? Yeah, I think it's becoming more and more available and you see it very much on quite a lot of the boat's um, websites. Uh, it's becoming, particularly if, it's, if your boat's more of a racing boat, sailmakers often have polar information because uh, when they're making racing sails, they know that um, they need to know that the boat's racing to a certain level. Uh, also, if you contact the, um, where you bought the boat from or the designer of the boat, they will have that information. And there's some really good websites. There's the Offshore Racing Club website, I know publishes a whole load of polos for a lot of classes. But one of the best places to get this now, um, the, I think there's 300 on our system, is actually on the Ray Marine Axiom itself. You're right, yes. Yeah, I know we've gone to great lengths to uh, gather polar information and build it uh, right into the system. And I think there's actually a video here that just kind of, we'll scroll the list at least uh, so you can see some of the names that are in here. Um, and I know we have a facility as well where people can send in polars. So as we do our periodic updates to our lighthouse operating system, uh, we'll try to add more boats and more polars to it. Um, and if you pop onto our website, onto our Lighthouse 3 pages, there's actually a spreadsheet um, and an email address, polars at raymarine.com, where you can actually send in the polars for your boat and our guys will try to get them integrated into a future release. Uh, but definitely worth checking out uh, if that's something that you're interested in. Now I noticed there are, there's a lot of models on there. Um, are these hard and fast you know, particular to that make and model boat, or is there some crossover, or could I find one that might be close to what my boat is if it's not already in there? The, um, the polars generally are specific to a certain boat, um, and 
you know, the, the, the designer would have come up with those numbers or that the, the mathematics would come up with those numbers for that boat design. But there are quite a lot of similar boats out there. And if your polar doesn't necessarily exist today, um, and you obviously send the email asking for it to be added, um, then you could choose a boat that you know is of a similar weight, dimension, size, sail area, um, configuration, etc. And you will be able to use those polars. It's better to probably to do that than not at all. I noticed when we're setting it up as well, there is an alternative in there for something called fixed angles. What, what's that about? Yeah, that really is if you cannot uh, find a polar or you're not um, comfortable with the polars, then you can actually just tell the, um, the system what you believe your boat's um, best angles are. Um, say that's 45 degrees sailing upwind and you can put that in and it will take that information and use that to do the calculations of your target speeds and your ley lines that we're coming on to. So um, let's take a look at some of the new screens that we've put into the Lighthouse 3 operating system. The last, um, the last three releases um, named after boating destinations, Annapolis, um, um, yeah. <laughs> well anyway, named after boating destinations, the ABCs um, added a lot of sailing uh, capabilities and, and features uh, to the system here. Let's take a look at the sailing screen, Greg. Um, so I'm told that this screen brings together all the most important information all in one place. What are we looking at here? Yeah, this is a, a great page, really. Um, I just uh, want to just step back very quickly uh, and say, once, once we've got this polar information, as I said, it allows us to generate um, the target speeds and the target wind angles. That a boat can sail to and, and it also then we can then add in actually the effects of current and the effects of leeway of a boat to work out what ley lines um, you should be sailing as well so on this display which by the way if you've selected the performance um, uh, key on the boat setting there's a boat detail settings if you say you've got a race sail boat and you select performance for polar or fixed angles this page will become available as part of the dashboard selection. So you just scroll through your dashboard selection and you will see this page come up automatically. So what you're seeing first and foremost on this, this page, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, one of the most important things is boat speed. And you're seeing straight away there, um, speed through the water is 6.4 knots. This is obviously just a, an example. And actually the target speed is 7.4 knots. Now, that straight away tells me that I'm not, I've got a performance problem with this boat. So that's great information to have. And it could be all sorts of reasons. It could be you've got weed on the rudder, your boat needs a clean, uh, or it could be just not trimming the sails correctly. Um, but there's, there is a reason to be concerned. Um, the other data you get on here, which um, is quite useful, is the fact that you've got your sailing distance to waypoint, you've got your distance to tack and your times to do these things. Now these are all great things for your decision making process. So you know that you've got, for example here, you've got something here which says time to tack. So in 12 minutes, that's basically saying you're gonna tack in 12 minutes to be on the ley line for your uh, next waypoint or your race mark. So you need to make some decisions. You need to get your head out of the boat and see when it's gonna be a good time to do that relative to the fleet or the course. And then, of course, the next bit is the, um, and I'm sure Jim will come on and ask the questions, uh, are the, the green and red segments on the window. Yeah, I was wondering about those. <laughs> so what these are, these are actually generated by that polar information that we were talking about. And what the green is showing, and you'll, you can obviously all see the um, yellow A arrow, so that's your apparent wind angle. What that's saying is you should be, that A should be within the notch for ideal performance on this boat in this given wind strength. So at the moment, that's telling you you're not quite sailing close enough to the wind uh, and you could go a bit tighter. And that's probably why uh, that coupled with your boat speed problem that I mentioned earlier is why this is showing the polar performance of 93% and not 100%. So are there times, so are, there times when that, are there times when that polar performance can go above 100%? It can do, but it shouldn't. 
um, it should always, you know, if it's if you're getting above 100 percent, then there's probably some other underlying calibration issue. Okay, interesting. Now I notice on the bottom of the dial we've got some orange indicators that have notches kind of similar to the red and green. What are the orange ones for? That's a good. That's a good question, actually. As I said before, when we were looking at that polar uh, diagram, our well, boats have ideal angles, and there are very few boats out there actually sail on a dead downwind on a run completely downwind they do but that's not their optimum performance virtually all boats benefit from what we call heating it up a little bit i.e sailing a little bit with the wind coming on a broad reach and those orange segments are for this particular boat where you should be sailing that boat downwind so in this case that notch is at somewhere around about 125 degree wind angle so you're not only getting your uh, upwind angles you're also getting your downwind angles for optimum performance that's pretty good so you're getting the best performance all around if you follow its guidance that's great yeah so it's a great great display i mean they've done a good job with the design of this so i know we can change the display up a little bit like we've got here so i see some chart on the left with some interesting red and green lines on it and uh, then we've got our obviously our data dials on the right so tell me what's going on here with these ley lines. Yeah, now I really like it. I, I, I've been doing a bit more tactician type sailing recently, and this really does give me a bigger picture. Uh, this particular example is quite good in that it shows that um, you've got uh, 1.6 miles to tap for the ley line, and it gives you a time on that as well. But what you can see, we sail all the way to the ley line on this situation, which you can see on the cartography side of the, of the image. We're, we're going to end up um, with an island in our way, which is not ideal. So going back to making good decisions, this is helping me to say, well, I've got to make a tack well before then, uh, if uh, I'm going to get to that mark quicker. The, uh, the other thing is, you probably don't want to go up and get stuck under the lee of that island where there'll be no wind. So you're probably going to be looking to want to tack somewhere in the middle. Um, there's another element on there that's providing great information. There's a little tidal arrow down in the bottom left. So you've got current and you might think, well, actually, I want to stay in the deep water in this situation to make the most of the current that's on the, on the course as well. Um, and I think there was one other thing on there that I wanted to mention. Oh, yes. If you look at the, um, the ley line where, the, where, it's, where it's saying to tack, you take the cursor um, up to the top again, Jim. Yeah, you'll see that there's like a little ghost um, sort of cone shape. What that's showing you is actually the fact that the wind is shifting. And had that island not been in the way and you wanted to tack on the ley line, when you start to enter into that shaded part of red, that would give you the first opportunity you would have to make that lay to the next mark. Um, should the wind be in this case in its furthest left and the, the the other side of the red will give you what i would call the safe ley line and that's something that cruisers would benefit from so you want to make sure you're going to get round a headland then you just sail on a bit further and then you will always make sure you'll get to round without them to do another tack particularly if you're short-handed there's definitely a lot of valuable information in there and it is actually very interesting too to see from from a navigational standpoint for someone that's you know maybe cruising and not racing that that ley line data is really just as important you know looking at that island that's in the way and, and taking into account the current and other yeah. things you know, it could make a you know make a passage a lot easier indeed yeah there's lots of good info there so i know we also enhanced some of our other navigation dials um, in the latest lighthouse three updates uh, and those are Annapolis, uh, Bermuda, and Cons are the names of them. The ABCs kind of uh, slipped my mind when I mentioned them earlier. Uh, but looking at this navigation dial here, this is this is great for uh, open water navigation. And I noticed it even this has some sailing enhancements in it too. Yeah, this is um, the classic um, navigation page, um, which I know many of our cruisers would love. To. It's got some. Um, you've got all the similar information all on one page here so you can see down there it's got the tidal arrow it's got your apparent and true wind angles um, it's got your course over ground um, arrow as well so you know what your SOG is um, and then you've got things essential information like your time 
uh, your estimated time of arrival, which I know is always very useful. Um, what heading will I be on when I tap? It's absolutely all there. So it's, it's a great screen. Yeah, these screens are pretty powerful. And, and one other thing I'll add um, to them too is that if you find um, that there's something on this screen that you don't quite like or you want to adjust or you want to see a slightly different piece of data here, these are editable too. So if you press and long hold your finger on whatever cell it is, uh, you'll get a pop up and you can change around the items that are in here. Yeah, good point, Jim. I meant to mention that earlier. So let's take a look at race timers and start line tools. Now these are obviously very race specific uh, items, but um, I, I hear that there's a lot of powerful information here as well. Yeah, now um, everyone who races, I think probably appreciates that the one key time of, of a race is always the start, um, making a start at full speed um, in a, what we call a clear lane without too many boats around you is uh, a fantastic advantage um, in this sport. Um, so to assist that with Ray Marine on these tools, we've now added the start line feature. Um, and it's very simple to use. Again, once you've um, selected the performance option, uh, if you slide your finger in from the left on a, on a chart plotter, the, um, there's a little menu, the three dots that you can actually see there. You click on that and one of the icons will be race start. And then you select that and then this will come up. And the first thing you then would do is press edit line and it will then very, very simply and intuitively uh, tell you what to do next. So it will say ping the left, ping the right, or ping the port and ping the starboard is what it actually says. And as you can see, we've done that in this example and it's drawn on the chart uh, where the, um, the port end of the line is, which is the red flag and the starboard line, uh, end of the line, which is the green flag. It's important to do this um, with your boat, you know, to motor up or to sail up very slowly to each end. So you get this data very accurately logged um, because sometimes, you know, being within a, just a quarter of a boat length of the line is what you need to do. Um, so don't try and use a, a waypoint, um, um, that, um, whatever you call it, a waypoint to put in, actually go in and ping it is much more advised. So once you've got the start line, Obviously, the next thing that would happen is the sequence of events of the start would go, and usually that's a five minute countdown. It can vary, um, but most places now have a five minute and a four minute, a one minute and a go. Uh, so once the race timer starts, another very, part, a very important piece of information comes up. Um, and that information is that one which you can see on the left hand side, which says time to burn. Now, what time to burn says is that's how long, if given your current position and sailing angle, okay, you will get to that start line three minutes and six seconds early in this situation. So you've got that much time to lose, if you like. You will be over the line by three minutes if you started now. So you, in this situation, would actually go around and do a few more circles and try and get yourself in a nice position relative to the other boats what you never want to do when using this tool is allow that time to burn to be a minus figure because that means even going at full speed, and Jim's just showing that now as an example, you will miss the start. You will be late for the start. You don't want to do that. Again, like our other, uh, like the ley lines, like the polars, this is using the polar information to work out how quickly your boat will go at this particular wind angle that you're currently sailing on. And it will obviously alter if you change the angle of your boat. So the ideal way to use this is to have some time there to burn, to be gradually building up speed, and then what we call hit the hammer with about 30 seconds to go. So you hit that boat, uh, that line, absolutely at full chat. Works really well. So it's pretty cool that all these integrated tools are in there and it looks like it's pretty easy to set them up and, and configure them. Um, I know with the race timers, if you just press and, long, press and hold on any of the timers, you can um, synchronize very easily as well. You can add a minute, take a minute away, synchronize to zero um, to get everything. You know. Yeah, if you go back a slide, you'll see that the timer uh, comes up in big, big letters. And all you need to do is just touch that to, and it will give you the option to either synchronize restart, whichever, whatever you want to do. You just get all those little um, 
intuitive menu items that have come up. And the other thing I forgot to mention, of course, is it shows you the line bias, the all important, which end of that line is favored. In this case, oh, I think yeah. you'd be a fool not to be at the starboard end. <laughs> so um, one of the things that you mentioned in the um, great to have list uh, was AIS and radar, if, obviously if your boat is of the right size for it. What are some of the, some of the kind of long-term intelligence that you can glean from looking at an AIS presentation uh, in a race or a regatta? Yeah, I think um, th th this really applies to when you're doing some offshore racing and I've uh, added a, a, an example of last year's round the island race because it was quite a good one. Um, okay, this is a boat that you can see all these boats um, racing down towards the needles on the Isle of Wight in our famous round the island race. And what you can see there with the AIS targets is clearly there's an issue of no wind uh, at the needles itself where everybody is bunched up. Um, so you, you, me as a tactician would make a decision there to perhaps not go too close to the needles and break, perhaps sail outside of that wind shadow. And sure enough, the boats that did that, and I see I've got Riverdance uh, showing there, I know they did this, and they gained a hell of a lot by going round the outside of the bunch. And some other information on there that's interesting is what the leaders are doing. You can see that the boats that have got away from the needles are actually heading out to sea. So they must have information that uh, says that that's going to pay. Maybe there's more wind or better currents. But again, it's giving you more information to make um, good decisions. It's an interesting perspective because so many people think of AIS purely as a safety or a collision avoidance tool, but, but here the information that that AIS transceiver sends out about that boat actually gives us some insight as to what's happening on board and how fast they're going. So it is very valuable. And I suppose yeah. you could do the same with a radar as well. Maybe uh, you could use the ARPA and, uh, and track the leaders or track other boats at different points on the course and see what kind of speed they're making. Yeah, and, and also with radar, you can track uh, rain clouds and rain showers. And of course, when you get a rain cloud and a rain shower, it's going to bring with it sometimes more or sometimes less wind uh, and from a different angle. And that can be useful information for, particularly for big offshore races. That's pretty good. Well, at this point, we'd like to open the broadcast up for questions. Um, there is a Q&A panel, and we invite you to chat your questions into us, and uh, we'll take some of them here live online. We'll give you a, a few seconds um, to, uh, to get some questions in here. Um, I got one in here from Larry. So Larry has a Catalina 380, and uh, he has the polars for his boat, and uh, he wants to know a little bit about uh, whether he can input them, input them himself, or request to have them input into the system. And off the top of my head, I don't know if the Catalina 380 is is in that list. Um, we can certainly take a look and find out for you. Um, but if it isn't, Larry, um, if you actually pop onto the Lighthouse Annapolis page, that was Lighthouse 3.9, I believe it was. Uh, we have a form on there and a spreadsheet. And if you plug your polars into that spreadsheet and then email it into us, um, our engineers will take a look at it, make sure the data is right, and uh, we will make our best effort to get that into a future release. We do want to get as many polars for as many boats as possible in there. Let's see what else we got here in our list. We got a few of them. Um, Jim, Jim Lee chatted in asking if there is a page with a list of all the polars. Um, you know what, I will tell you right now that I don't think there is a definitive list posted online. And I'm going to take that down as something that we can take a look at, see if we can get that up there. That list uh, is updating all the time, so uh, yeah, we'll see if we can get that information out to you, Jim. So uh, here's a, actually a great question. Um, do all Axiom displays have these features? Greg, can you tell us a little bit about how we would actually get access to this on any, any given Axiom? Yeah, I have to admit what we have um, talked about today is the Lighthouse um, race or uh, sailing features for 
um, Lighthouse 3 on the Axiom. I think there are um, some of the features are different to what people may have with previous models. So what we've talked about today is specifically for Lighthouse 3 and Axiom. So it's available on any Axiom display, whether it be a, a, um, the Pros or just the standard Axioms or the XLs. Uh, but the way you get the features is you go into the, um, the boat setup and you, you select the race sail for your boat and you select the uh, option to, to put in performance and you either have fixed angles or take the polar information. And then you work out either your boat or a light for light boat from the polar table. And then all these features are available. I mean, you do have to have some of the things like you, if you, we talked about AIS, you do need an AIS uh, sensor. You do need a compass sensor, obviously, to get all the, uh, the appropriate data items. Um, I've got another question here related to start line. This was chatted in by someone who goes by the name Airbus, and he wants uh, to know a little bit more about um, how to set up the start line and uh, what, um, basically, how do you mark the start line at the start of a race and what does the word ping refer to? It sounds like he may be kind of new to racing. Could you kind of go through that start line procedure for us, Craig? Yeah, that's the classic where we guys take so much for granted, don't we, with the words we use. Um, so um, it's actually interesting now um, in major regattas um, in a lot of boats where this feature of um, pinging the start line is, is allowed, where the, the race officer will actually give a few more minutes before the start race to allow competitors, because most, you know, so many competitors are using this tool. Um, and what it basically means is you, um, you, you're going to put the, 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 the two ends of the lines as a waypoint onto the chart. But we're just, for the sake of the, what we do here, we call one end the port end and the other end the starboard end. Um, and you need to nudge up, to one end usually the committee boat, um, and you nudge up to the, boat where the flag is and you hit the there's a button that comes up on on the on the axiom and it says ping starboard end and you do that and then you go and sail down to the what is usually a boy end which will be the port end and you say it's best done very slowly so that you can you can get that data in as accurately as possible and then you will see on the chart those two icons the Red, uh, red flag and the green flag come up, which shows you successfully ping those. It's actually very easy once you've done it once, you'll, you'll, you'll pick it up pretty quick. Right up. Yeah. Um, another good question in here, um, uh, this is chatted in by Anonymous. Um, are there polars available for boats modified with roller furling mains? So it sounds like it's kind of a specific application or may maybe not. Uh, is it common for there to be like, multiple polars for a particular boat, depending on what it's equipped with? Yeah, no, it is very, um, I know, for example, um, some ranges of boats come with taller masts, keels, longer keels. Uh, they have like an S variants uh, of those boats, um, which perform differently. And in some cases we do have those variants polars. Uh, I think long term, the plan is is going to be to allow people to enter their own polars, but that's not quite there yet. And it will come soon if they don't already exist. But there are quite a few um, configurations of different models of boats that are already in there. So I want to thank you all for tuning in. I want to thank you, Greg, for joining us and sharing your expertise with us. There's certainly a wealth of information here. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for listening in. And with that, we're going to sign off for today. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I hope you are all doing well at home, dreaming of voting soon. And uh, we will see you again on our next webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jim. Stay safe. All.